About this time last year, we pulled up some fall tomatoes and we were quite surprised to see the root system was distorted and we thought we had nematodes. Now to remind you what a nematode looks like, it's a microscopic worm and here's a picture of one. So it's pretty small and there are good nematodes and bad nematodes, but the bad nematodes will send out a stylet and actually stick it into the root system of plants and suck out the plant juices and actually become parasitic and live off of those plant roots. As a result, the symptoms of the plants are going to be very distorted roots, very knotty and, and uh, grubby in growth and hardly any little white fibrous roots and that's very evident on the tomato roots that we saw pulling up here and also some carrot roots that we pulled up so there's several vegetable crops that can be affected. Now we weren't quite sure so we wanted to make sure we sent in a test and the way that we did that is basically like a soil sample. Throughout our bed here we went in and we collected several different areas and we went down into the root system. You can use a trowel or a soil probe and then you want to make sure the soil is moist to start with and you get about a pint sample and you take that into your county extension office. Now if you can't get it in there quite a ways you need to store it in a cool place like a refrigerator where it's cool and moist. You don't want to freeze it and you don't want it to get too hot because you'll actually kill the nematodes. Then once you get to the extension office there's going to be a form that they'll have you fill out that'll look like this and they'll need some information about the type of crop, the soil type, those types of things. Once it gets to the lab, there's going to be a charge now to do this, anywhere from $10 to $15, depending on if you do just a soil sample to check for nematodes or if you send in roots. If you do both, it's going to be $15. But basically, they just suspend the nematodes, they put them in a dish, screen them out, and then they identify them through the microscope to make sure it's the bad ones, and then they count how many are in that sample. When you get your sheet back, they're going to have a number written in here, and that number is based on a chart and kind of based on the fact, well, if you have so many nematodes in this area that are bad, it's a high enough population it could cause problems and that's what the numbers will mean and that's what they'll tell you in the report. Now as luck would have it, our report came back telling us that we had high populations and that it could be a severe problem. So when you have that many nematodes and it could be a problem, well what do you do to control them? Well I don't know if a lot of people have heard about planting marigolds, which is a trap cropping or intercropping process. And we thought, well, we'd do a little study to see if we could plant some plants in here that would actually reduce a population of nematodes. So what we did, we tested last fall in 1992 our nematode population. We tested again in the spring of 93 to see if it had dropped, and sure enough it had because there's nothing growing here during the winter. Then we put in our trap crop and then tested again just the past two days. So let me tell you about the demonstration again a little more specifically. We divided this bed up into four plantings, two plots of marigolds and two plots of vinca or annual periwinkle, which are also thought to have some properties that might reduce nematode populations. The marigolds now, keep in mind, have to be French marigolds only because that's the only one that has the most significant drop in population. Things like African, American, big or Aztec marigolds really don't work. So again, look for French marigolds. And the way to know you're getting a French marigold is by the genus species, uh, Tagetes patula. And if you look for that when you're ordering your seed or getting your plants, you're sure to get French marigolds. Now, the ones we tried were a new one called French Vanilla that were kind of an off-white or vanilla color, more of a yellowish-whitish color, a pretty nice change of color, but not as attractive as some of the others. And then with our periwinkles, we used one called Hot Streak, which was very low-growing from Grimes Seed Company. And then the other periwinkle was Blush Cooler from Burpee, and we also got the French Vanilla Marigo from Burpee. So we appreciate those companies donating the seed, so there were nice new varieties as well and add a little bit of color to the demonstration gardens. Now, we planted them April 15th after our frost-free date. They struggled a little bit early on because it was kind of cool and wet, but once I started growing, we put them close enough together to make sure the root systems intertwine and grow throughout the entire raised bed. That way we were making sure we were having effective control. We just pulled them up a few days ago, took samples again in the four plots, and just to save on time, I want to compare just one of the plots for you to show you what happened. 
The number in 1992, in the fall of 92, for root knot nematodes was 156, which came back on the chart being a high enough population to have concern and cause problems. Then the spring of 93, the graph shows that it had dropped to 24. And again, remember, nothing was growing through the winter, so we have a natural drop in population anyway. Then we put the plants in for this year, and our most recent test in the fall of 1994 showed 24 root knot nematodes. So we felt like that we did get a drop in population. Now in both plots of marigolds, there was a pretty significant drop in nematode population. The vinca, on the other hand, one of them dropped where the other one we actually had a rise. Now there are other plants too that are thought to have these properties in addition to vinca and marigolds, also sesame and cereal rye grain. Now the verdict is really not complete yet on what it is that's happening. Some of the specialists feel like that it is a chemical property kind of similar to what we know about with the allelopathic reaction to walnuts where there's a chemical toxin that maybe is secreted in the soil that kills those nematodes. Others believe that the nematodes actually penetrate on the root system and the chemical toxin either kills them then or they can't get loose again and they're not able to reproduce so there's still a drop. Whatever it is, if it's working, it's a good practice to put in. Now, so the bottom line on that is just sticking one marigold throughout your garden doesn't work. You have to put them closely in blocks and rotate out your planting beds to try to reduce the population like we've done here. Now in addition to trap crops like marigolds, etc., sanitation is very important and this is probably the most significant thing you need to remember. Anytime you're using tools in these types of beds, we're getting ready to turn it over. Before we go to another spot in this garden, you've got to sterilize it. And here we have a bucket full of Clorox 10% uh, solution and some other chemicals to kill those nematodes out. If you're going to till this area with the tiller and then go to another spot in your garden or go to a neighbor's garden, you've got to clean it off and sterilize it or you're going to move the nematodes because they're so small they can't crawl through the soil. They have to be carried on some kind of mechanical um, method to get to another spot. So sanitation is very, very, very crucial. Also, if you just leave it fallow a season, you're also going to reduce the populations because they're not going to have a food source. So that's one thing. Rotating your crops. If we know tomatoes are always going to have problems or okra or carrots, rotate in with something else like lettuce or cabbage or co-crops that maybe aren't as susceptible. Also, the root knot nematodes over the root lesion nematodes, they actually prefer sandier soils. So if you can add organic matter to the soils by putting in uh, green manure crops or crops that you can till in or just adding any kind of organic matter, leaves, etc., you can help reduce the population's nematodes because they don't like high organic soils. Also, resistant varieties. Remember, especially on tomatoes, you can buy VFN, well N stands for nematodes. The tomatoes we had in here planted last fall were nematode resistant, which means they're really tolerant. And they were, they looked just fine above ground, but when we pulled them up, the roots looked bad. So they were tolerant to the nematodes. Now if they ever get stressed, they could become susceptible, but it's kind of like an insurance policy. So buy plants that are uh, tolerant or resistant to nematodes. And the next would be soil solarization. We've talked about this before where you're covering the area during the hot part of the summer like July, August with clear plastic and you want moisture in the soil, the sunlight will go through the plastic, heat up the soil high enough to kill nematodes or reduce the population. Now that's only in the top few inches. One study I just read about was saying if you'll use like bubble wrap like we have here that you get in packing, that it actually will heat up the soil even more and it will even heat it up deeper. Well, anything that's clear plastic that will absorb the heat's gonna work as long as the soil has moisture. Now, it's not gonna kill them all, but it's gonna reduce the populations to maybe help you be able to live with the nematode problem. And then lastly, of course, is chemicals, and it's getting even more difficult because Vapam, which was really the only thing homeowners can use, has just now 
over the past year gone to a restricted use chemical. So you would either need to have a restricted use license to buy those kinds of pesticides or you'll have to hire somebody to come in and, and use Vapam or some of the other chemicals that are a soil sterilant. So that's really not an option anymore unless you choose to hire somebody to do it. So you can see really, just like we've talked over the past several years, it's really putting several pieces together to manage this problem. It's just not one thing, it's several things. So you can try all the various things and really have some success to it. So I'd encourage you to be sure and be observant of what's going on when you're pulling up your plants this winter. Look and see if you have nematode problems because you may have to put into practice some of the controls that we've just talked about.